Good afternoon, my name is Garth Ross. I'm uh, the Vice President for Community Engagement at the Kennedy Center in Washington, DC, and a producer, like my colleague Esther Park here with Young Arts, uh, and produced an event with Jason, uh, exploring the intersections of music and skateboarding up in Washington, DC, and so glad to, to be a guest here today with all of you, and so excited to be here with the great Mark Gonzalez. The great, <laughs> thank you. The great, that's nice. Got to own it. Say. Um, after seeing this thing up here, the I'm happy to be here, and to, I hope I can help someone. <laughs> and also, so thrilled to be here with the great Jason Moran, also Young Arts alumnus. <laughs> Things come full circle. It's nice to see that. So I want to. Um, start off this discussion with some words that, that Mark himself shared with the world in an interview in Interview Magazine a few years back. And this is something I'll toss out to both of you. Mark, you said, I think that things are poetic when they don't have a boundary. My life is poetic. It's better to live in a world of poetic meaning rather than hardcore reality. So I think for a lot of us, we see music and skateboarding, we might have a sense of how that makes sense together. But uh, can you talk about this, what's poetic about the lack of boundaries? How does that, what he said, how does that grab you? I don't, I don't know what hardcore reality is. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Um, um, earlier today, sorry, Garth, we're gonna no, please. continue. Um, I look up into the air a lot, but earlier today, when we were outside and there was a time where we were supposed to kind of like get together and talk. But Mark was skating and I was just playing. And, and I was re telling Esther, I was like, no, that's us talking. <laughs> us talking is actually not talking. It's actually just doing our work in the same space. Because I think our relationship that I felt with music was, was that it was language, that it's not just sounds but that is actual language, and some people understand it, and some people don't understand it. And the subtleties kind of can fall away, but that's like the beauty, you know, of kind of like talking with people and not really knowing that they're listening, you know? Um, and, so, and so I don't know what, his, what this guy's reality is, and when he says he hopes that he helps someone, yeah. he don't know how many people he already helped. He helped me as a young teenager deciding to dedicate my life to the piano after skating for many years and seeing for the first time a video, one of his videos with the music of John Coltrane made it for me like, oh, so my passion for this piano solo <laughs> is warranted because this dude said it was cool. <laughs> and really it was because he said it was cool. <laughs> yeah, um, it's, yeah, it's still cool. <laughs> it is. <laughs> no, I, <laughs> we were um, in the room upstairs, and uh, I don't know what we were doing, drinking coffee and water. Hi. <laughs> it's my daughter. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, I was skating outside, and uh, I was trying to, like, having grinds and moves going to the, to the music that you guys were playing, and uh, I don't know if it was Chuck Treacy, either the bass player or the person on guitar, someone started to change the tempo, and I said, well, maybe that means slow your grinds down, but <laughs> sometimes you can try and slow down, but uh, other times you have no control. <laughs> I don't know, but uh, it was really nice to play to live music. Thank you. Oh, it's just the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> I'm old now, I can't do much more skating. That was it for me. <laughs> but I think uh, also for, for people, um, I mean, what, and, I think what you just witnessed with these young students kind of talking about their passion is, is artists don't really have a way that, they don't have a cutoff point. They don't have a clock out. I'm a clock out at five o'clock and I'm not gonna think about singing the song for nine hours. It doesn't work like that. You know, it, it, it's incessant, it wakes you up at night, it makes you stressed, uh, it gives you relief, uh, you know, it makes, it helps you find love, you know, like, it makes you find anger, it helps you express anger, you know. Um, it's not like a cutoff point. And I think for, for, for like the beginning of the conversation, there is no cutoff point mm -hmm. for kind of how we find relationships within music or, or movement. And Mark, 
how did you come to put uh, Coltrane behind your section, your segment for video days? Because that was so meaningful for so many people. Why was it meaningful for you? Well, there had been a couple of different tracks and different styles of music that I was uh, trying to decide on and to put in, into the into the piece, and uh, that one seemed to f to fit the best. I mean, I there was. Uh, I like the one, R Ruby, My Dear. Do you know that song? Of course. And um, That's a Thelonious Monk song. <laughs> I mean, there's so many, and I like, I mean, there's so many, so much music that the, that's so, so awesome, and it goes really well with skating, and um, the one we picked, it seemed to fit, because, I mean, in skating, as I was saying earlier, it's like uh, you attempt something, and then you... You may not make it, and then you like you pause for a sec, and then if you try something that you know you can make, you'll make that because you know you can make it. You make that, and then you go back and you try the thing that you couldn't make that you've tried like 15 times, and all of a sudden you've made it. And I think that a lot of uh, the jazz. I mean, I'm not a musician. I don't know really what they're doing with these with their music, but. They'll do, I can hear the music that they're like going like, dun, and then they're like figuring it out and they say, oh yeah, this fits right in there. But a lot of it, it has to do, it's a lot what we're doing in skateboarding, in street skating and in for, and just skateboarding period. You, you're trying, you're constantly trying and seeing what's gonna fit. And the song is actually working, that's, it's like, it's like a language. The two go together without even knowing it. So uh, I don't know how it happened, but, uh, I'm happy that it did happen. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because skateboarders as a wider group have developed into such a musically omnivorous culture, you know, that listen to so many different styles of music. And I think that was a pivotal moment. Uh, one thing about young arts is they support artists through the process of becoming who they want to become. And that process involves necessarily a lot of failing, a lot of falling, and certainly improvisation, which is yeah. an intersection point between skateboarding and jazz, uh, involves being daring, being courageous, and falling. How does falling fit into skateboarding for you? Well, uh, it's unfortunate. <laughs> <laughs> No, I, it really is unfortunate, but, uh, you know, a lot of the music, like, especially uh, Thelonious Monk, when he's hitting the keys, like, sometimes, like, when you're, like, out on the street and you're, like, skating, you know, and you're, like, waiting for, like, maybe to meet a friend and you're at, having a moment of not skating, you're resting, all of a sudden you hear, like, the walk sign is on. Like, it seems as though, like, I don't know if they had the computers back then to say walk sign says go, but it seems in his music he's already did it before. It, it even came around, like, you know what I'm talking about? Like, yeah. I, yeah, I there's don't know. Yeah, there's a way that, I mean, you know, part of the magic of a man like a Thelonious Monk is he knew how to kind of like leave a lot of space. Yeah. You know, people say that some of the phrases around him, they say like, oh, he, he composed with space. Yeah. And sometimes with, Musicians really think about is how much I'm playing, you know, yeah. but also, but he's more like, where's the relief? You know, yeah. where's the space around it that gives it the context for this phrase that I just played? Yeah. But also, like, he would make notes that sounded, that you might not think he did that on purpose. Yeah. But he, all of a sudden, he really codified that language and then, and made it, no, this is my sound that I've been structuring for a very long time. Yeah. And there's a very famous musician here. Yeah. There's a very famous musician here who played with Thelonious Monk, wow. a great bass player named Dave Holland, and he must stand up, and we must give this man some applause, because Dave Holland is in the house. <laughs> great, great, great bassist. <laughs> Thank you. We, were gonna, we, we planned a celebrity moment, and that was our celebrity, <laughs> a great bassist. <laughs> Um, but yeah, like that, that part also, like you kind of bring up a thing that, you know, when I'm, okay, so the sound, like I grew up in Houston and the sounds in Houston are like, um, like locusts, yeah. you know, huh. and 
a, a, a car with a booming system, you know, yeah. and, and then a bunch of nothing, you yeah. know. <laughs> and then I moved to New York, yeah. you know, at 18, I moved to New York, and that's not that at all, yeah. you know. Um, and there's language, and then there's rhythm on the train, and then there's just a mass of people having their own private conversations in front of everybody else. Yeah. And then I started to understand, like, okay, so this is where this music also comes from. Like, yeah. it comes from the activity. It comes from the intersection. It comes from, you know, like, like all of the pieces coming together for a musician like me who hears everything like that. Yeah. So when you imitated a, like standing at a at a at a crosswalk yeah. and hearing the rhythm of yeah. you know the the voice yeah. and then the car horn yeah. and then the, your you know your wheels on the pavement yeah. you know, like or you know like any pro everybody in here probably has walked on a sidewalk and then heard an approaching skater. I hope they've walked on the sidewalk. <laughs> yeah. You heard it coming yeah. up the sidewalk behind you, and you like, it's like the sign. Yeah, I'm at the age now where I actually get scared of skateboards myself. <laughs> hey, whoa. Right. <laughs> but like, so, you know, like those, like those sonic signals yeah. for me have been like such a major part of how I tried to put music together. And yeah. so, like, even when we do these performances outside, we mic the ramp too, oh, because wow. I love the way the sounds of wheels are on the board, uh, on the on the wood, yeah. on the coping. You know, I love the way when the body hits the hits the like it's part yeah. of the drum set at that point. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so one thing that fascinates me is about street skating is. A lot of us mere mortals walk down a street and we see a street and we see stairs and we think that's how you get up to that house. Or we see a ramp and we say that's how you get down to that loading dock. Skaters see the world in a different way. As you were developing street skating, you know, can you speak to how you engaged the street, how you looked at it maybe a different way? Um, I, I don't, I mean, I mean, I, I was showing off a lot. <laughs> You know that I was showing off. Um, yeah, I don't, sometimes I was trying to, uh, you know, be cool. I don't, <laughs> and sometimes I had to go quick. <laughs> I don't know, really. And uh, so things like handrails. Yeah. Skating on handrails. People hadn't done that. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's kind of a a paradigm shift for skateboarding. Maybe nobody knew it at that moment. Yeah, what but what was that first try like? You know, uh, well, before you get on the handrail, you have to do, you have to know how to ollie. So, we did a lot of ollieing, <laughs> you know, a lot of pop off the ground, and so we, you're popping off the ground, you hit the ground, and the board jumps up with you, and then once the board is up with you, you learn how to do that, and you're in the air for a little while. Um, when you jump down the stairs, you, so you don't have to ollie, really, to go down a set of stairs. You can just go really fast and just fly down. I think that's how maybe Mingus would have done it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he doesn't... Why do I have to jump? I mean, why do I have to hit my tail or pop? I can just go down, just fast and, and make it. But so what I'm telling you is, is that we started popping and getting our boards to come up with us. We were trying to copy Alan Galfin in the bowl. So we're just trying to you know, do that So uh, on the flat. So we started popping off the ground and getting our board up with us. But the rail goes down. So if it's a steep rail, you don't really even have to pop that hard. You just can just turn on and pray to God that you get on there. <laughs> Level out and just go down, turn off at the bottom. It's really copying the vertical skating, you know, just trying to ride up the edge of the pool and then sliding around the edge of the pool and then coming back in. We didn't have the, uh, I don't know why we did it. You know, me and Nautis Coppice, and there was a few of us that were the early handrail skaters, but uh, I, I, I don't know what, what, why it happened or what, it's a little strange, yeah. I love watching video of you from skating in a bowl or a pool or a ramp to skating in the street, because it's almost like you turned the street into a skate park. Kind of, yeah. I mean, kind of, especially with the the wall rides, you know? I mean, it, it, so 
Um, the first time I heard about a wall ride, it was the skater Nodis Kapas, and uh, I was actually into punk music at the time, and I was going to punk shows a lot. And uh, this one kid, he was well, he wasn't a kid; he was he was much older, and he had a car, and he'd drive us around or whatever. And he's he was from Santa Monica area, and I lived inland, and uh, and uh, we we would go with him to the gigs, to the punk shows, and. Uh, he told me, you know, there's this kid that can ride up on walls. And I said, that's that's fascinating. <laughs> you know, I go, wow, really? I gotta see this guy. You know, because I was really good myself at the skateboard. <laughs> and I go, wow, I gotta see. It. So I went to go see this guy, and uh, it was with my buddy Paul, and we go to see him, and he he was really funky. He did it all. He just jumped like this, and after he did it, he went, and he had like the the long hair down like this, like Dennis the Menace or something. And uh, he had a, a piece of a nose guard on your skateboard. He had it uh, drilled into the top of his skateboard on the back. And uh, and we asked him, what's that there for? You know, to maybe make it jump easier or to do his ollie better. And um, he didn't really tell us, but I, would <laughs> I still don't know why he had it there, but... <laughs> I mean, he was good, but it was really funny the way he, like, blew his hair up. And it... <laughs> These are the finer points of the development of skateboarding. The hair, the inexplicable piece of gear on your board. No, it was, it was like culture clash, you know? He, yeah. I mean, my neighborhood was not Compton, but it was, you know, southeast, south central, but to the east, you know? And uh, we didn't, I don't know, we didn't... We weren't really like from Santa Monica. Like, you know, we weren't Santa, from Santa Monica or the nicer area, but it was okay. Sure. Well, that makes me think about boundaries again. Earlier on, I was quoting yeah. you. Um, you're a skater. You're an artist in many different ways. Yeah. Uh, visual, poetry. Yeah. But what, I mean, for, I went in a whole different direction, but what I was really saying is, is that the wall rides now, to the extent to where, they, where they've come, when he first told me, I was like, yeah, I got to see this. But now, so you got two sets of stairs, you know, like you got five sets of stairs and then flat ground, like maybe three feet. And then you got another set of five, right? Mm -hmm. This kid, uh, he's really, he's a tall kid. I mean, he should be a basketball player. He comes, excuse my language, hauling ass. So he's like kicking ass, comes down, hits the wall and rides along the wall to the bottom, two sets of stairs. Whoa. I mean, I... <laughs> you know, I, I don't, I mean, doing the handrail, but I mean, this, I mean, you know, I mean, I mean, for me, it's still, f <laughs> I don't care what I've invented. This is more, you know, what I did is okay, but this is even better. <laughs> I mean, honestly. Well, Jason, uh, so, you're a skater, you're a musician, you have opportunities to create new things in artistic spaces around the country and around the world, and it's starting to feel like a bit of a movement with this live music and skate as public performing arts. You know, can you give us a little bit of insight into how you decided you wanted to put your creative energies into that and open doors for skaters into the world of the performing arts. Right. Um, I guess maybe four or five years ago, I was SF Jazz, the San Francisco Jazz Institute, was building their own venue in San Francisco. And, um, and they asked, OK, so you know, you'll be a co-artistic director. And what kinds of programs would you like to do? And you know, as a kid in the like late '80s, my family took my brothers and I to San Francisco, and we and we skated, and we went to EMB, you know, and it's just like, and that place was like Disneyland for us. It was like unbelievable space, and um, and I remember being there. This is a tangent, but I remember being there with my brothers, and we just made since we didn't really know you, yeah. we just made anybody who was good. Oh, that's Mark Gonzalez. <laughs> like it, it wasn't even him, but we were just like, no, that's 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 definitely Mark Gonzalez. <laughs> Like he was a myth in my family, but um, so when so in all the years going back and working and playing in San Francisco and always kind of like observing skaters and you know like their relationship to the city, mm -hmm. I thought, oh well, you know, we should just bring that into this space. We should put a ramp right in front of the stage in this venue, 
and let's just have a public jam session. It's nothing more than that. It's very simple because I know and I feel the relationship between the two and I hear it every time I watch video. Like they really carefully choose which soundtrack, whether it's a hip hop group or whether it's a jazz group or a punk group or like they're really meticulous about what song goes with which skater. Yeah. And um, and so that felt natural to me to kind of like put that kind of thing on in a public display, but in a very casual way, you know. Mm -hmm. And so that's how it kind of started. And I talked to some people. I talked to Ray Barbie, like, like, and I said, you, and I was asking him because I, he's a great guitarist, but he's a really great skater too. And I was asking him, like, so what do you think about this? And he said, Jason, man, you just look. You know, like how there's jazz police, there's skateboard police too. <laughs> You know, and he was like, yo, man, you don't want this to be corny, man, you know? <laughs> and and that's a really, that's a really pertinent, you talk about, you know, you want it to be cool, yeah, you know, yeah. like, <laughs> that's a really important part of the equation. And so how do, you make a, how do you make a situation where musicians can feel comfortable being like, we, we okay, I work with a, a contemporary dance company or a ballet company, but have I ever worked with some skaters before? Not really, so the, the situation is very unique. And so that, and, and through those, we did it, presented it there two years in a row. And then a couple of years later, then at the Kennedy Center, we had this beautiful 10 day festival called Finding a Line, which was massive. In front of the Kennedy Center, we had this huge bowl and this whole street skating area and invited tons of people. And, um, but it's a thing that I feel as much as I play all around the world and play beautiful concert halls and beautiful jazz clubs and beautiful jazz festivals, and I love those experiences. I really do cherish them mm -hmm. for what I've learned on those stages. But I also know that, that for me to continue to, to, to have a relationship with the music, I have to make sure that I'm not playing to the same people over and over again, mm -hmm. you know, as an audience. And like, that's a real performing arts kind of like wall, like programming for the same audience and act like that's success but it's actually elimination of a wider public, a much wider public. And so how do you kind of like really show like, yo man, I just wanna just play some music and let's just kind of get together and show something that's kind of in process rather than product, but like just process. Like we're all kind of out there presenting things that are unfinished, which you, what we might experience tonight. It's in process, it's not glistening with a bow around it, you know, and, and so that, for me is important for, for audiences to witness also. Mm -hmm. And that's a good thing to tell me to shut up. <laughs> no, you, you make a good point. It's not, it doesn't have the bow on it yet. It's just, it's, it's not de fully developed yet. I mean, like his wall ride wasn't fully developed yet. I mean, I'm sure it's developed now after <laughs> that other guy, but yeah, I see what you mean, really. Yeah. I love that you talked about um, not being corny. Um, hard. It is, it's hard, it's you hard. know? Um, <laughs> And one of the pieces of feedback that I loved getting um, in, in DC at the Kennedy Center is when skaters would say, whoa, this is, I didn't know what this was gonna be like, but it's like a ramp party, you know? It's like a ramp party. Can you, can you talk about like what the scene is like at a ramp party when there's music blaring and maybe it's a band, maybe it's a boom box and everyone's hanging out and... It sucks when the music stops. <laughs> Okay. No, I, mean, I mean, that's all I could think about. <laughs> I mean, that's an interesting point because as we presented these a number of times, it's hard to really say when does this end? Because at that point, people just want to continue. You know, the musicians could continue, yeah. the skaters can continue, the audience who's kind of witnessing it really is, can flexibly come or go as they wish. But it really doesn't really have an end point. And that's, you know, a beautiful part about a performance is it kind of really kind of can gradually just become something else. Yeah. And then we do have to kind of wrap it up in some way, but we, you know, each time it's very different. Yeah. Like I have no idea what's actually gonna happen mm -hmm. out there. You know, I know some, 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 some people are gonna come play with us and, and that's gonna be beautiful and interesting. And, uh, but after a certain point, we just kind of continue. You know, people are familiar with um, a record or a single uh, in music, uh, a concert tour. People are familiar with X Games or watching a video of somebody sticking a trick. Uh, but the development process in both jazz and skating is sessions. So you said this is all about process. Um, what's it like having a session, which maybe for you, 
uh, as a jazz musician would happen in a studio or in, you know your studio up in Harlem or in a rehearsal room uh, or you having a session at a local park or some spot can you tell us what's it like having a session in more of a performance public performance space in kind of a performance context inviting the public into a session I mean it's it's is we're all very vulnerable at this moment uh, when we decide to <laughs> when we decide we're going to do this in front of people. Uh, but you're vulnerable even when you're in your community of people too. Yeah. You know, like even maybe more vulnerable. You know, like you know, everyone's I, I like stopped going to certain jam sessions in New York because yeah. I didn't like the attitude in the sessions. Like just the vibe of people. I really am sensitive very sensitive and like if it's the wrong kind of energy on the bandstand then hey you know what you got it it's cool I'll just walk away um, yeah. and so in these situations uh, in private jam sessions I kind of like try to like so you have like so Mark was trying to stick a trick earlier you know like you have things like okay on this song I'm really gonna just conceptually try to address it I'm gonna try to approach the song from this way you know I'm not gonna do my normal kinds of phrases. I'm just like, if I follow that line each time it comes to this part of the song, where can I, where can I turn next? I mean, and it's literally turning as, we, as I play. Um, and, and there's all kinds of fumbles that happen because the hand doesn't wanna do that yet necessarily yet. You ain't figured it out what the fingering or the phrasing is. And, and the band thinks that you're messing up, and you are messing up, and but you continue to like, oh, let me have another chorus, let me take one more, you know, and mm -hmm. and you try it again when it gets to that song. And certain people like John Coltrane kind of write songs that are extremely difficult to to maneuver through, extremely difficult to maneuver through them. It sounds very graceful when he does it, mm -hmm. but not when anybody else. <laughs> mm -hmm. And like it like and so and so really great artists like him or Monk or any of these other people we kind of like laud over and over again the reason we we do it is because is if you actually sat down and tried to trace those steps you would understand how deeply they were planting their feet at each moment that seemed like they were light as a feather it's really stunning i feel like you could be talking about skateboarding when you were making those maneuvers with your fingers i was thinking about mark's feet like what you do to a board in the air that is barely visible yeah. to most people there's so much going on yeah i mean I well, like I said, I was, you know, you had to pop the board, get the board to come up with you, get on the rail and go down. That's difficult. No, it's very, it's very difficult. I mean, these guys, it, it's, it looks really easy now. Yeah. It looks, you know, kids are doing the flip into it now, but, you know, it, it's very difficult. I was trying to, like, explain almost anyone <laughs> could do it. Anyone could do it. You don't have to learn how to ollie. Just find a handrail that's steep and ride out, and you don't have to ollie, but just balance and turn off right away. It doesn't take, you don't have to be the best to do it. You really don't. I, mean, I think I speak for everyone here when I say he's inspired us to go out and look for a handrail that's just real steep. Are you feeling it? I'm, I'm feeling this. Um, I really wish I could do music. I would like to jam with these guys. So, you, so you, okay. So he said he was trying to learn. Wait, what song was it? Uh, Benny and the Jets. Yeah, right. Benny and the Jets. So we're gonna. Boom. So he's gonna sit in. He's gonna sit in boom. tonight. <laughs> boom, 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 boom. Right. You can play just that line, and then you know we'll see where it goes. You have to show. Do you know that song? Yeah, we can play. It. Okay, well, we're gonna play that later. <laughs> Little teaser for later tonight. So we got two really interesting minds and two really accomplished path blazing people up here. Are there any questions we have for these guys? This is a, a salon. We have food and drink. We have these minds. We have each other. All right, in the back. Okay, I'm going to repeat that because that was a pretty cool question. Um, he was saying what, what the, the crux of it was how do you address competition in an arena where it's not codified like basketball or something? He said like you're trying to impress somebody or show off or you're trying to, you know, whatever. But 
how does competition fit into that for you? I mean, I'm not, I don't, I can't answer. I mean, I just, for, in my terms, like how he was saying earlier, if, if it, sometimes the aggressive competitor are like someone's approach could be wrong. And you say like, I, I don't actually want to skate in this, in this environment. Like, I, I got to go like, you know, and just find a new spot. But then there's other times like where, um, like you showed me the Caballero doing a hand plan at the thing in DC and I was just trying an eggplant. An eggplant is different than a hand plant. Although you do go upside down on both of them, I wanted to do an eggplant and I wanted to do it better than Caballero. <laughs> 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 Though I like jazz and I like to influence somebody by doing one trick and then they do it and then we collaborate and do something better, I can be very, like, I do have to slam dunk at times. That's right. That's no, I don't, true. I mean. No, that's very true. Because, uh, um, um, so, I, you know, when I uh, got to New York and I went to Manhattan School of Music straight out of this performing visual arts school in Houston, which was awesome, called HSPVA, when I got to New York, I like did like a scan of who was in school with me, you know, mm -hmm. like, and I was like, y'all suck. <laughs> <laughs> and I said it and I was just like, nah. And then they thought I was just being Texan or something, you know, but I was like, I said, nah, next year, my boy, Eric Harlan is gonna come up and you know, you'll, you'll understand like what a real drummer is. And he came up the next year and then they were like, oh, oh. And so, you know, but there is a thing about playing about and the way that I have fortunately been tested because for us for musicians it, it's generally about a, a test that we get from a great master a great master says come here I want, I want to show you something and you get on stage with them and they start to play a song and they look at you and they say so what do you have to say <laughs> and they walk away and they leave you right, and they drop the mic, right? No. And, and, and that's a real moment mm. of, that goes beyond that competition thing, because I've just had some teachers say to me, mm. you must you know, align yourself with the Pantheon. The, mm. My great teacher, Andrew Hill, said that. And for me, as a student, I never ever was scanning or thinking about my relationship to the fellow students. Mm. It was like, because you know what? I'm kind of like looking at McCoy Tyner. That's where I want to go to. Or I'm looking at Ahmad Jamal. I want to get there. And so if, we, if he and I are sitting at a piano together, then I must have something to say, you know? And over and over through my career, I've had those people. And in, the, in our world, we call them stripes. Like, you get a stripe when someone says, you know, oh, that's, that's okay. It's a real thing. Dave Holland gave me a stripe <laughs> one day. Wow. It was a real deal. <laughs> it was a real deal. Wow. That's mentorship right there. Any other questions? Right here. I'm Alfredo, and I'm a jazz junkie. So <laughs> this is a question for Jason. Uh, and for both of you, really, this event is badass. It's amazing to bring young audiences to jazz. And congratulations. Mm -hmm. But my question to you, Jason, other than this, globally, what have you seen that is bringing younger audiences to jazz events? Oof. Um, it's difficult to say. I mean, you know, it's difficult to say because I can't see everything. But uh, uh, along the way, I've seen musicians really. Uh, 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 OK, so there's a musician named Kamasi Washington out of LA. And he's done something that charges a lot of people. And it's global now, and it, and it was very quick how it happened. I mean, it's been less than a year, and he's been around the world a couple of times, based out of LA. Amazing musician. But I think for him, it's about energy, you know? And sometimes we might think that it's about like some kind of like gimmick or something, but I think he really tapped into like, nah, this is really about collective energy and how that can kind of, kind of like overtake a crowd. And whether they hear it on the record or they hear it live, and that has been pretty inspiring to watch, you know, from for his perspective. Um, but you know, the what I the way I see generally people getting taught because of the way I work is is generally through schools. Like the health of the community is actually extremely healthy, you know. Um, there's all just like there's tons of skaters all around the world, you know. There's tons of musicians trying to study jazz all around the world and figuring it out at varying levels and degrees. But I think what ends up happening is we don't have outlets for them to really kind of like try stuff, not like 
show me your like uh, like I was saying before. Don't show me the product. Just like give people a space to kind of like workshop. You know, public spaces for people to workshop, and they don't have to be big or glamorous, but that could be the the, the space that I think we need as kind of like artistic community around the world. More more spaces for us. You know. Interesting. Other questions? Uh, right straight back. I got a question about the process. Do you uh, start with a motif and then see how the skating goes and jump into that? Or do you start with the skating and then pick up the music? Or is it different every time? How does that work out? Um, it's different every time. I'm not sure tonight. But the one thing that we always do start with is a, is a kind of a blessing of the space and a blessing of the ramp to ensure, you know, in some way, the other entities around us that you know people remain healthy through this experience and then from there you know we kind of like try to find things i mean i have a selected a, a few pieces that i think really work like clearly thelonious monk really highlights you know how how i don't know it highlights a lot and i think you'll hear it tonight um and then when people come join us we kind of follow us so if, if the skater chuck trees steps on stage and starts playing a reggae groove, then we'll follow him and we'll just sit, sit in that for a while, you know, and see what happens. Another question out there. I just wanted to add oh, on oh, to sorry, that. Sorry, Chuck Treese's, uh, I like that. I asked him, I said, what's that you were doing on the guitar reggae? He said, yeah. <laughs> no, I really liked it. It sounded good. And the other, some, the, what would you call the pinging noise? Yeah, this is actually just a pinging noise. <laughs> <laughs> it sounded like good. Sonar was yeah, it was good. I liked yeah, it. Yeah, I was sending it out. <laughs> There's a hand over here, right? Yeah, fifth row. Uh, yeah, I had two questions. Uh, was the skateboard you were talking about earlier Evan Smith? Which I'm assuming, maybe? Uh, uh, with the double set? Emmett Smith? Evan? Evan? Emmett Smith is Evan. a football player. <laughs> I'm trying to sell skateboards to all of them. <laughs> <laughs> And sneakers. No, I'm kidding. Yeah, there's uh, there's X Games, there's Street League, there's uh, I don't know. It's really uh, you, you got to get in where you fit in. I don't know. Is that about? I don't know. That's it. Yeah. I mean, you said something also earlier, which was I thought was important, which was like. Well, you, like you say, oh, well, you know, I don't really want to skate here. Then you find a new spot. Yeah. Like that is for me been the major kind of like turning point was, well, why would I try to dance in the same dance space? Yeah. It's yeah. like, I mean, y'all got that. Yeah. You're really doing that well. I don't need to be there. Yeah. <laughs> I need to be over yeah. here chopping these woods away. Yeah. And making, you know, like it's a really, yeah. um, and that's scarier, I think, to do. Um, you you know you lose some people along yeah. the way. <laughs> But I've been thinking, you know, I mean, just to go back to what you were talking about, there needs to be like, you know, like a lot of these competitions, they're all sponsored by either Nike or you know, they're all like sponsored by people. I'm, in my opinion, I mean, I, I like to think of skateboarding as in like terms of jazz. Like if Nottis does a trick, he might do like a, a tail slide, right? I'll accent his tail slide by tail sliding, but when I come off, I'll give a quick shift and then shove it, like a backside shove it out of the tail slide. So in my heart and in my mannerisms and the way I skate, it's more along the lines of jazz. I'm not so competitive, but with all this stuff coming out in the Instagram and all this stuff happening so fast, I keep thinking there has to be some sort of greater competition Like that's like quicker and more kind of not not to be gruesome, but more deadlier. Like where the competitor is just like, wow, that really hurt. I, I, I got to get my game up or else I'm going to get, you know, like, I mean, it just shouldn't be for like Nike or for a sponsorship. It should be more like I'm going to do this, but I better be careful because if I don't do it, I'm going to get cut. You know what I mean? Like in terms of art and in terms of like competition and like really difficulty, I mean, like. Why stop, you know, why stop the competition, you know, or like just raise the competition, make it harder and make it more difficult, more deadly. I mean, I think that would be awesome. 
<laughs> All right. I mean, what, 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 what name brand would want to back that? <laughs> it's the Hunger Games of Jazz and Skate. <laughs> Uh, the, all the way in the back. Yeah, it's a good point. Yeah, that's a really good point. Yeah, and it's also, you know, like, like, okay, so growing up in the 80s, my father had a bunch of records, and it was a lot easy to buy a lot of jazz records because nobody cares about jazz. <laughs> <laughs> like, you could go to Salvation Army, and this is, like, great records for 99 cents. So you, and, and there's an accessibility factor that I think is a big point, you know. Uh, like, my grandmother had a piano that I practiced on before my parents got a piano, you know? And, and I thought like there was a certain kind of like openness to the form that street skating kind of like represents that, you know, you don't have to have all the plywood and the design and the space in your backyard to have a ramp, but you could just use the bench outside, you know? Like, and, and for us in my neighborhood in Houston, that was a, a big thing to kind of also realize is that, is that our street was worthy, you know? Uh, was worthy to put time and put blood on. Um, so as a, but as a musician, like there was just a kind of like a way where you're just looking at the, the small elements, you know, you talk about kind of like paring it down for a student, like, yeah, you want to get them to kind of locate, locate their center, wherever it is, you know, and then if enough people really kind of locate their centers, then they'll find like the tribe of people with a similar center. And the more I travel and the more I meet and talk with people or work with people, and I understand that there is like definitely a tribe of people, but you have to let the student know that it is, it is about simplicity. But it is like, you know, like a, a, another word that kind of gets batted around frequently is about honesty. Uh, you know, like, we're, you know, you know well, I'm trying to play honestly, or, you know. Um, and there's something in that, in that zone, too, that, that, the, that the future player, you know, of whatever form has to kind of reconcile they have to reconcile their differences within necessarily maybe their family structure, you know, their or them, their relationship with them and their instrument, whatever it is, you know, like, what do I feel like about this piece of wood that has all these strings in it and all these keys and how big it always has to be and I can't move it, you know, or him with just a slab of wood and four wheels and trucks, you know, like, like you know, like that relationship is very personal. Um, <coughs> And maybe the more difficult part is like letting that, that student know that they can find the rest of their life will be, can be through that very small pipeline. Like everything else can jump out of that. I never would have thought as like a kid, mm -hmm. and probably you too, like that the thing that you fell so head over heels in love with yeah. would transform everything, you know? Mm -hmm. Cause that's not really what your soul like in other schools. Like, but now nah, that the passion actually does feed, you know? Yeah, it sounds like what you're talking about, you're talking about, and you're talking about in the back is uh, finding your own voice through whatever your discipline is. So it could be the piano, it could be the skateboard. And, um, you know, I'm thinking about what's about to happen out on the plaza, and I think one of the things that's pretty intense, or can be pretty intense, when a group really starts to become a unit through an experience like this, it's almost like in that moment, the group is trying to find their voice as a, as a community just for this 90 minutes or what it is, whatever it is. And uh, I'm excited to, to see that play out tonight. I, did, I didn't come here to skateboard though. I just came to do the speaking, but I was having fun. I mean, I really, I mean, like I said, I like the reggae on the, on the 
No, he was doing the reggae strumming on his uh, rhythm guitar. <laughs> I don't know. That's your song. <laughs> any, any other? Oh, oh uh, I saw on the way back on the, against the wall. No, no. Any one more question? Oh man, three hands at once. This is crazy. Um, okay, I'm gonna go. Well, you know, like sometimes like old guard is like my grandmother, like that's old guard, you know? I mean, I say that seriously because I think sometimes we could pay attention to masters, but the only way we really learn how to learn is probably not through them, but it's actually through your mom, you know, or your cousin who ranked on you that you sounded bad in a concert, you know, like it's something like that, you know? Um, but I don't, I get worried around old, I mean, this, like a term like old guard, because that means that they can, became out of style, you know, like. Well, well I, yeah. I feel like actually as a producer, even though you didn't ask me the question, I feel like I, I kind of hear where you're coming from and I can respond maybe on behalf of myself and Esther in a way um, that the, the performing arts establishment doesn't put their season together and say, okay, what are we gonna have in the ballet season? What are we gonna have in the jazz season? What are we gonna have in the, the skateboard season? Like that's not really how that works. Um, so when you as an artist or as an organization are making a departure from the norm, what gives you the impulse and the, the courage, the confidence to do that? And I think ultimately it's about the honesty of the conviction that you feel with the people that you're working with on that to, to, to make that departure. Maybe sometime it's on your own, just you yourself feel that conviction and you feel like it's your truth, like you were saying earlier. Or other times it's just another person coming and you know, when we talked about it years ago and I could tell that you felt deeply that there was something there that mattered even though you couldn't put your finger on it. And it was hard to descri describe it because it hadn't happened before, like in terms of old guard, right? There's this, there's this uh, canon that you can look back and say, oh, it's like that, it's like that, it's like that. Well, what if you're trying to do something that's not like any of that, whether it's in skateboarding or in jazz or in you know, presenting uh, public events? I think I'm excited to hear some good music. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I like tracing. I mean, I don't know, like tracing, like, I mean, like tracing, like, tracing an idea or tracing a song. And, and that's the only way that I've kind of learned how to transfer. Like I had to trace from people that I didn't, didn't know, like a guard, you know, and especially within jazz. And so that part is seminal to kind of, like, or just like him seeing like somebody wall rap for the first time. Like that becomes a thing that you then like, okay, so how will I kind of like get up that wall? You know, and, and I know for me, for all the people that I studied with, and studied with some really great musicians that they kind of teach in that way to kind of have reverence, but also not to like sit there and just stare at them all day. You know, at some point you have to get eye level with that, you know, and then maybe even look down on it. You have to be disrespectful to it too. You really, I mean, from the people that I know, you really do have deep. to disrespect it for you to actually learn something about it, you know, um, like the, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I'll stop there. <laughs> that, that, was, that was an interesting takeaway, so maybe we should stop there. So uh, please, a big thank you to Jason Moran, Mark Gonzalez. Thanks for having me here. <laughs>